Hello, and welcome to Sobercast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting Sobercast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Hi, I'm Michael, I'm an alcoholic. I'm going to I'm going to time myself, because... Uh, if I don't, I'll just never stop talking. So forgive me as I set that up. Um, I've, I've had a really great weekend. I don't know if anybody else has, but uh, it's been pretty wonderful. Uh, and I, I've gotten to know a lot of you guys in a way I never got to know you before. And uh, I, uh, I got to see there's some guys here that I, I had judgments about. In my mind, my, my my alcoholic mind told me that you know, and I'm not. I'm, I'm specifically not looking at anybody right now. <laughs> my alcoholic mind told me that you know these people are this way and that way, and I and I and and I came here and my mind was open when I got here, and and I saw that those people that I thought were this way or that way were 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 so much deeper and so much more amazing than I imagined them to be. And uh, so it's been a fantastic weekend. So. Uh, uh, I'm supposed to talk about steps eight and nine, and uh, uh, at Randy's meeting, uh, um, the the noon meeting at the spot, we we recently did that, and and we were all talking about eight from the twelve and twelve, and we were all talking about nine, and and Randy made the comment, it's almost impossible to talk about eight without talking about nine, and so if my little presentation kind of jumps back and forth between eight and nine, forgive me. Um, so step eight is uh. And I'll I'll read it because I don't want to get it wrong. I made a list of all persons I had harmed and became willing to make amends to them all. So when I came to Alcoholics Anonymous, I looked at this step and I said, okay, I understand that. I, I know what that's for. That's so that I can get the people back who I've driven away. And that's part of this process. It's important for me to get these people back so that I can go about the business of getting what I need from them. <laughs> and so when I made my amends when I was early in sobriety, that was my intention. My intention was to go to these people and convince them that I had changed so that they would love me. And uh, sometime during that process, something changed for me. I stop trying to explain why I did everything, all the things that I did, and I just started to say, these are the things that I did, and I'm sorry. And the things that I was apologizing for were things like stealing money from the the family of my best friends, you know, stealing money from their daughter, you know, really low things like people who like had taken me in and, and, and fed me dinner like, you know, night after night. We were on the same block growing up together. And then I, I just I totally screwed them over. And so going to these people and making these amends was such a humbling experience for me that in sp- despite myself, something happened to me, despite the fact that I was going there to try and impress these people with my ability to be honest, something changed. And so I, I became addicted to making amends because it was, I got such a rush off of it. And years went by and I began my journey into untreated alcoholism. Um, and I would create wreckage in my life and, and see myself creating wreckage in my life and be unable to stop myself creating wreckage as I was doing it. But there was something the name for God. Something in my mind was telling me, God, you shouldn't be doing this, dude. This is this is not right. And, and I'm screaming at somebody, how dare you step in front of me in the line? Who do you think you are? And there's like 15 people on the train and they're all looking at me like, who's this crazy guy? And I ride the train to work with these people every day. And they're like, oh, that guy again. And, it, and, and nobody ever knew who would be the next guy to like, to like, piss me off and have me flip out at him in public and just, just spit all my venom and all my stored up hatred and alcoholism and character defects all over them. <laughs> and then I'd get away from that and, and, and I'd calm down. I'd, I'd be like, ah, oh, I gotta make an amends to these guys. <laughs> I'll show them how good of a guy I am. And so I'd track them down on the train the next day. <laughs> 
and they'd be looking at me like, what do you want, man? And I'd say, I just got to say, I'm really sorry. I'm really sorry for shouting at you. That was really wrong of me. And they'd be like, okay. And those same people would witness me doing that to somebody else two weeks later. So what was happening for me? But the thing is, is after I made that amends, I felt so good about myself. I was like, I'm really a spiritual guy. And so the process of making amends for me became an ego feeding proposition. It was all about self gratification by false humility. So, what is step eight really about? I didn't learn what step eight was really about until I came to prime time about six years ago. And it says what step eight is about right in the beginning of the step, in the first sentence. It says, steps eight and nine are concerned with personal relationships. First, I take a look backward and try to discover where I have been at fault. Next, I make a vigorous attempt to repair the damage I have done. And third, I didn't know there was a third, having thus cleaned away the debris of the past, I consider how, with my newfound knowledge of myself, I may develop the best possible relations with every human being I know. That's the purpose of this. This is so that I can become the kind of man that not only never has to make amends, because invariably I'm going to make a mistake and I'm going to have to make amends, but I become the kind of man that when I make an amend, I know that what I did was wrong and I'm living a way of life based on these steps so that I don't repeat that behavior in two weeks. I don't continue to be that same person. Um, so, you know, I, 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 I looked it up in the dictionary to find out what amends mean. And I found it says amends is a sum of money paid in compensation for loss or injury. And that's certainly something that we have to do is if you know, alcohol, it says in the book, alcoholics owe money. And so that's something that I have to do. It also says something done or paid in expiation of a wrong done. And I said, but what the hell is expiation? So I looked that up. And expiation is compensation for wrong. The act of atoning for wrongdoing. But I can't atone for a wrongdoing if I keep wrongdoing. For me to atone means I have to have a change. And the reason why step eight is in the eighth position instead of in the second position is because for me to be able to really have this process work, I have to have had a change of character sufficient for me to be able to see that I'm actually the person in the wrong and it doesn't matter what anybody else has done and that all I need to do is to become is to have the, the, the atonement. And it's not for the other person anymore. There's something about that there, but it's about me becoming the kind of man that everybody wants to be around. It's about me becoming, not because everybody will love me, but because there's something that I have that, 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 that communicates a sense of peace and well-being. And, you know, uh, I've talked about this. You know, I, I, uh, I finally gave up trying to find a woman I was talking with Tim about this earlier. I finally gave up trying to find a woman and instead really sought God. And I really sought God hard. And suddenly all these women appeared. And, and I married them. I married one of them. You know, and it's, it's this thing. It's, it's, step eight is about continuing to build this relationship with a power so that the power is the guiding light for my life and not me. And when, the power is the guiding light in my life. When I recognize my defects of character and I see my shortcomings and I become willing to have them removed and I, and I, and I strive toward being a giver and toward humility, the things that I did, I just no longer do. I heard um, there was uh, my mother and I were talking 
and she was telling me about this book she read about the Ten Commandments. And I believe it's Emmett Fox's book, The Ten Commandments, but I've never read it, so I can't say. But she said that in the book, the Ten Commandments say, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not you know, lust after your neighbor's wife, and so forth and so on. And growing up, I was always like, okay, you know, bad boy, don't do this. Bad boy, don't do this. But what she said was actually that when you live a spiritual life, you won't kill. You won't lust after your neighbor's wife. You won't do these things. Because the power that becomes the power for my life doesn't do these things. I become the kind of person who shan't kill. I become the kind of person who doesn't take things in vain. And so I can't make these amends until I've started to become this kind of person. So in order to be able to know you know, how to make an amend, I need to know what a harm is. And on page 80, it talks about a harm. It says, I might next ask myself what I mean when I say I have harmed other people. What kinds of harm do people do to one another anyway? To define the word harm in a practical way, I might call it the result of instincts in collision, which cause physical, mental, emotional, and spiritual damage to people. So if we go back to page 42 in in the fourth step, it says, Yet these instincts, so necessary for our existence, often far exceed their proper function. Powerfully, blindly, many times suddenly they drive me, dominate me, and insist upon ruling my life. So what we learn in the fourth step is that a defect can be an instinct out of control. So, for me to know what kind of harms I've done, I have to know what kind of person I am and what my defects of character are. And once I see what my defects of character are, it's very easy for me to identify the harms that I've done because anybody who's come in contact with me when I'm using a defect, I'm harming them. They may not, they may just like, ah, whatever, I'm getting out of here. But I'm harming that person because I'm using my instincts. I'm, I'm getting so carried away in what I want and what I need that I'm smacking right up against whatever it is that they want or they need. And I'm trying to manipulate my way into getting what I want. And I'm pretty good at that. I've been practicing it for a long time. And so when I create that kind of a situation, I create a harm that I need to amend. In the seventh step, we talk about the idea that um, shortcomings are things that I fall short of, things that I should do that I don't do. And this is a harm that I create as well. I have a, a, a mother and a father that I, I love very much, and I have these resentments against them because you know, they didn't do the things they should have done. And I use these resentments to justify not calling them, and then I get angry that they don't call me. What kind of parent doesn't call his own son? <laughs> and so for years, I would like call them like every five months or something, and like just out of compliance. And when I when I when I came to prime time and started doing this eighth step, I put them on the list. But I had made the big amends. I had made the you know I'm sorry I like stole everything from you. I'm sorry I like you know, did all these horrible things to you when I was a kid. And I'm sorry that I like cost you so much money to put me through treatment. And I, I, all those amends were made. And my parents had reached a point where they were like proud of me because I had turned my life around. But in my four step, I made this list of people that I resented. And because I resented them, I harmed them. Because that's what I do. If I hate somebody or if I'm angry at somebody, I'm going to let them know. I'm going to somehow make them feel it. So this shortcoming of not being a good son became a harm that I had done to my parents. Irregardless of whether they never call me, I never called them. And so I started calling them. I made a point to call them once a week. And what happened was right around this time, I don't know, maybe about I don't know, two months after this or three months after this, my father had to have hip replacement surgery. And he's uh, he's had very bad health. We were talking about this earlier. He had polio as a kid, and he's had all kinds of horrible operations all through his life. 
and so I was in the process of calling him. I called him, and, and I was calling him once a week. And then when he went in for the surgery, when he went into recovery, I called him every day. Every day I called him, and I talked to him. And during his two or three month period of, of recovery from this, I shared with him my experience with my own back surgery, and and I just related to him, and I listened to him, and he was depressed, and he was struggling with pain and the inability to do these things. And our our relationship changed in this way that he he found like a, a deep love for me that he never had, and I found a deep love for him that I never had. And so in the process of making this amends for a shortcoming, I made this relationship. And he's 69. He's going to be 70 in a couple of months, and he's not in good shape. And our relationship has become this amazing thing now. I'm going to go and see him in a bit. You know, and it, it, I did the same thing with my mother. I called her. You know, I'm, she's coming out here. We're going to go to Disneyland with my niece for, uh, for Christmas. And, you know, it's this kind of... It's, it's the kind of humility that that infects me because it's certainly not something that I'm uh, producing within myself. I become infected with humility. <laughs> it sounds bad. I become blessed with humility. <laughs> and this humility enables me to be wrong. It enables me to be the kind of person that can say I'm wrong and to forget about the wrongs that were done to me. And I can make this list. On page 87, in the 12 and 12, this is the last page in, in the ninth step. It says, above all, I should try to be absolutely sure that I'm not delaying because I'm afraid. For the readiness to take full consequences of my past acts and to take responsibility for the well-being of others at the same time is the very spirit of step nine. So this process is about taking full consequences of my past acts. It's about taking responsibility for the well-being of others. Not because I'm going to get high from getting amends, from making amends. And that happens. That does. When I make an amends... I have a spiritual experience. Sometimes I make an amends and I don't get what I expect. The person says, well, I don't, you know, whatever, you hurt me too much. I can't, I can't see you anymore. And in that particular case, I can walk away. If I have emotional sobriety, I don't, I don't need the, the reconciliation from them because I have a power that gives me everything that I need. And so I can go and clean my side of the street and allow the other side of the street to remain in disarray as long as I've done everything I can to clean my side of the street. So what are some of the amends that I had to make? You know, 19 years in sobriety, I came to prime time. And I hadn't really, uh, hadn't really done anything really horrible. Well, okay, that's a lie. <laughs> I hadn't done any drinking and drugging exactly drinking and drugging related behavior besides the fact that I was the same man sober as I was drunk but I was no longer overtly stealing I was no longer intentionally lying I was just kind of a scumbag and uh you know I, I started in the steps with Jeff my sponsor and, and he, he he put me on this exercise and he said you know I want you to go through the 12 and 12, line by line, paragraph by paragraph, and I want you to write down what they're telling me to do and what they're telling me not to do. So I went through the, the first step, and um, it gets to this part in the end of the first step, and it says, who wishes to be rigorously honest and tolerant? And so I wrote down, I must be rigorously honest and tolerant. And when I did that, when I wrote that down, I thought to myself, well, what are the things that I'm not being rigorously honest and tolerant about? And I was like, well, I'm only on step one. I really don't have to worry about this yet, do I? <laughs> but I saw right then and there something that I had been doing for years and excusing. And this is for me. And I'm only talking about for me. I'm a pirate. 
I'm an IT guy. I'm very clever with computers. And I have been stealing uh, intellectual property on the Internet from musicians and software developers and, uh, you know, movie makers and, and all this stuff. Just downloading them because it was free and because it was, you know, I'm entitled and why shouldn't I? If I can do it, why can't I do it? And I had accumulated thousands of dollars worth of music and software and uh, uh, high-end software, like software that costs two, three thousand dollars, and and movies, and uh, and I was still doing it. And I said, you know, I always justified, ah, I'm sticking it to the corporate man, you know, or something. I always had some justification for it. But but I'd had a spiritual experience, and the truth wouldn't leave me alone. And so, again, and I say this, I say, this is for me. This is something that I had to stop doing, and I'm not saying this to anybody else. This is for me. And so I stopped. Before I got to the ninth step, I stopped doing this. Um, and I started purchasing. If I wanted a movie, I would buy it. If I wanted a, an album or a song, I would pay for it. And if I wanted software, I would buy it. And I, and now I, I, I'm... I'm not sticking it to the man. I'm supporting the people who made these things. I'm giving back to people who are giving me the things that I love. Music, movies, software. And so my way of making amends to this is to now slowly go through the collection of the things that I've stolen and buy them. And it's not something that I need to do all at once, but something in me changed and I stopped pirating. And I became something different. And that was a powerful experience. And that's what it means to make an amend to me. It's not to say, I'm sorry I was wrong. It's to say, look, I see that I'm wrong. The actions that I've taken in my life are the wrong actions. And now I want to take the right actions. And so this is how I'm going to try and live my life today. So there's all kinds of... Uh, of stuff in the 12 and 12 about this. And uh, when I, uh, it was, I was sober for many years and I never read the big book. And I never read the 12 and 12. I, uh, I went to meetings and I thought that meetings were um, recovery. And I, uh, I shunned the people who read the big book and who read the 12 and 12. And then I came to prime time and I found out, well, there's uh, there's something to this 12 and 12 and I started reading it. But I was like, but the big book is no good. I'm not going to read the big book. And then recently, I started reading the big book. And I'm like, God, this big book is pretty amazing. <laughs> there's all this really great stuff in here that I've heard in meetings and I've always been like, wow, those guys are like really smart. Where did they come up with that? It was in the big book. <laughs> So, um, I'm going to read some stuff from the big book. And, and I wrote, and I, I, I've taken the time to go through and write the page numbers down because I've only recently started reading the big book, and I'm, I'm not a memorization guy. So, um, there's all kinds of stuff in the big book about this process. And so... The first thing it says right off the bat on page 76 in the big book, right after it says, you know, we're done talking about step seven, and we move into step six. It says, uh, it says, faith without works is dead. Faith without works is dead. I can't be a good guy unless I be a good guy. I can't be a good guy unless I have a relationship with a power. And if you go through the 12 and 12, and, in, and, and you read in every chapter in the 12 and 12, there will be something that says something along the lines of, this is the beginning. This is the beginning of a new way of life. This is the beginning of freedom. This is a way of life that we live. This is a way of life. And all through the 12 and 12, it keeps saying this over and over again. This is a way of life. This is a way of life. And it starts, I'm seeing this in the big book. It says, this is a way of life. Um, I'm reminded of the scene in the new Karate Kid movie where um, 
this kid wants to learn Kung Fu from Jackie Chan. And he's got an attitude. And he has this problem. He never hangs his jacket up. So he comes with the Karate Kid's like little dojo. Or the, the, his master's dojo. And he, he goes to hang his jacket up and he misses the hook and it falls on the ground, which is what he always does. And Jackie Chan says, pick up your jacket. So he picks up his jacket and says, hang it on the hook. And he hangs it on the hook. And he's doing some like, you know, he shows him how to do it in some kind of Kung Fu way. And for days, he comes to the dojo and all he does is has him pick up his jacket and hang it on the hook. Pick up your jacket, hang it on the hook. Pick up your jacket, hang it on the hook. And the guy's like, why am I doing this? And instead of just saying, you know, block my shots with your pick up the jacket skill, he says something that's really profound. He says, Kung Fu is in everything you do. It's in the way you hang up your jacket. So this is a way of life. It's in everything I do. It's in the way I hang up my jacket. It's in the way that I have relationships with other people. So in order to make this list, uh, as I said before, I've already, um, I've already done a four step. And in the four step, I've listed all of my resentments. And with the help of my sponsor, in the fifth step, I identify all my defects. And I become ready to have these removed. And I, and I ask to have them removed. And then the same thing with my shortcomings. And so I know who are the people that I, that I have to do. So I go back to my four step, if I haven't burnt it. And I take that list, and I write it down. And I sit down with my sponsor, and I say, OK, these are the people that I've harmed. And my sponsor sits with me and says, okay, and it talks about in the 12 and 12, there are, in, in, in starting to make amends, there are, uh, you can group the people into, like, people that you must make amends to immediately, people that you can, um, you know, strive to find to make amends, and then people that you can make amends to over a longer period of time, and people who you will never be able to make amends to. So I, did, I sit down with my sponsor, and we go over this list. And we group these people together. And my sponsor says, okay, why don't you start in the first six people on the list and come back and talk to me when you've done that? And so I, I start with this process. It says in the big book, it says, um, my real purpose. My real purpose is to fit myself to be of maximum service to God and the people about me. This is what I was talking about before. My real purpose in doing this is to be of service. It's not to get something. And so this is the spirit in which I want to go about making these amends. I don't make this about me. I don't make it about who I've become and the spiritual guy that I am and the program that I've discovered and how maybe this can help them too and how, check me out, I'm so great, and how, you know, you've got some problems and maybe you should come by and... You know, do you want to hear my speaker tape? <laughs> I've done that. I, I, uh, before I, uh, shortly after I got divorced, I went to my ex-wife and I said, here's a speaker tape of mine. Maybe you should listen to this. <laughs> I wonder what that was about. <laughs> so... <laughs> That's not what this process is about. <laughs> this process is about cleaning my side of the street. So it says, uh, there's all kinds of things that come up for me when I make my amends. One of them is that I may need to make amends to someone whom I believe has harmed me. Or I may need to, need, need to make amends to someone that I've never really reconciled with and who I have a real beef with that I don't like. So it talks about this in the, in, in the big book. The big book's got all these really great instructions, real practical instructions on how to do this. It says on the bottom, it's on the bottom of page 77, in the second paragraph, it says, the question of how to approach a man we hated, or the question of how to approach the man I hate will arise. It may be this person has done me more harm than I have done him. And though I may have acquired a better attitude toward him, I'm still not too keen about admitting my faults. Nevertheless, with a person I dislike, I take the bit in my teeth. It's harder to go to an enemy than to a friend. But I find it much more beneficial to me. I go to him in a helping and forgiving spirit, confessing all former ill feelings and expressing my regret. And this thing here, it says, 
I find it much more beneficial to me. Ultimately, this is a program for me. So that's like why here at the retreat and, and in prime time, we always read this in the first person. Because I'm the person who has to recover. I'm the person who has alcoholism. And I'm the person who needs to find God. And so ultimately, what happens is, this is all about me becoming a better man. So when I humble myself and go to somebody who I have a resentment again or who I believe was the bad guy, I have to actually really be honest and identify, well, you know what? There was something. There was some part of me in this that did this. And I have to go to this person now and say, hey, you know, buddy who stole all this money from me and, you know, slept with my girlfriend, you know, I'm sorry that I, you know, called you all those names. I'm sorry that I, you know, I punched you when you weren't looking. And when I do that, I become infected with humility. I become blessed by humility. Because it's impossible to do that without God. It's impossible to do that the way that I'm supposed to do it without God. And I have to go with God into this process. And whenever I invite God into my heart, God fills my heart. And I become closer to that relationship. I have more of an experience with that relationship. So these are the most powerful amends I can make. It talks about what we do about money. On page 78, it says, Most alcoholics owe money. I do not dodge my creditors. Telling them what I am trying to do, I make no bones about drinking or thinking or being a jerk. They usually know it anyway, whether I think so or not. Nor am I afraid of disclosing my alcoholism on the theory it may cause financial harm. Approached in this way, the most ruthless creditor will sometimes surprise me. Arranging the best deal, we can let these people, uh, I can let these people know I am sorry. My alcoholism has made me slow to pay. I must lose my fear of my creditors, no matter how far I have to go. For I'm liable to drink if I am afraid of them, afraid to face them. I'm liable to live in untreated alcoholism if I'm afraid to face them. At a retreat, one of my first retreats, someone did uh, the ninth step, and I asked the question. I should probably read the ninth step. The ninth step says, I made direct amends to such people wherever possible, except when to do so would injure them or others. And so the question that I asked was, and I wasn't anywhere near the ninth step, somewhere on the second step, I said, what happens if making an amends will injure me? And I wrote the question down and I hit it with all the other questions so nobody would know that I was the person that asked. What happens if making an amends will mean that I might have to go to jail? What happens if making an amends means that, you know, I have to tell my boss that I've been lying on my timesheet? And... The answer that I got was kind of surprising. And that was, do it. But the second part of the ninth step says, except when to do so would injure them or others. And so now I've started to build a life. I've started to build a life where people begin to count on me, like my family. I'm the primary source of income for my family. If I go to my boss and say, you know, I've been lying about my timesheet, I may get fired. So I can't make this amends without going to my family and saying, hey, I'm about to do something that may cause me to lose this income stream. Because then I need to make an amends to them for losing the income stream. And so I go to them and I go to my sponsor, and it talks about this in the book. And I reach a consensus with this person in such a way that I'm not going to harm them by making this amends. And then I go forward and making the amends. And sometimes that amend may be not to tell my boss that I've been doing that, but to not do it anymore. And it's hard for me because I believe that I should be paid more and I'm hourly. And so I should lie on my timesheet, but I want to become a better person. And so I work to make this amends as a living amends in my life. I don't know if I'm doing that right, but I'm doing my best. So 
So it, it talks about that on 79. It says, uh, reminding myself to find it. The jail question. Reminding myself that I've decided to go to any lengths to find a spiritual experience. I ask that I be given strength and direction to do the right thing, no matter what the personal consequences may be. I may lose my position or reputation or face jail, but I'm willing. I have to be. I must not shrink in anything. Usually, however, there are other people involved. Therefore, I am not to be hasty and foolishly martyr. Um, I'm sorry, I'm not to be the haste the hasty and foolish martyr who would needlessly sacrifice others to save myself. I'm a good murder. I'm really good at punishing myself. But when I begin to build a life where other people depend on me, if I punish myself in this way, I cause a lot of harm to them. When I start to become the kind of person that people want to be around, those people become attached to me and sometimes become, come to depend upon me. And so I need to find a way to reconcile this without hurting them. Because it's not their responsibility that I did the things that I did. It's my responsibility. It may wind up that I do that. You know, they may say to me, you know, you can't have this hanging over your head. You got to go and tell the truth and we'll let happen what happened. And that's a good relationship. And when that happens... I can do that and I can be free of that in that way and then take those consequences. I can tell you honestly that I never told my boss that I lied on my timesheet, but that I don't lie on my timesheet anymore. I don't know if I've done that right. I'm doing my best. Page 82 in the big book. There's this neat little bit about, uh, oops, wrong page. Okay. It says, the alcoholic is like a tornado, roaring my way through the lives of others. Hearts are broken. Sweet relationships are dead. Affections have been uprooted. Selfish and inconsiderate habits have kept the home in turmoil. I feel a man, I feel a man is unthinking when he says that sobriety is enough. He is like the farmer who came up out of his cyclone cellar to find his home ruined. To his wife, he remarked, Don't see anything the matter here, Ma. Ain't it grand the wind stopped blowing? And that's me. I get sober. <laughs> and I say, Whew, we made it through that, didn't we? And there's that old Lone Ranger joke, Who's we? Kimasabi. I'm still suffering from everything. <laughs> I have post-traumatic stress from living with you. I have amends to make. So, second paragraph of page 83 on the big book, it says, the spiritual life is not a theory. We have to live it. Now, I was saying before about how if you read this book, or when I read this book, I saw all these places where it says this is a way of life. So it says right here in the book, the spiritual life is not a theory. We have to live it. So I want to talk a little bit about what begins to happen to me. And I guess I have talked a little bit about that. What begins to happen to me by this process? And instead of talking about it, I'm just going to read something from the book. And I used to go to meetings. And uh, I'd hear them read this little pamphlet. And I would, lie to, I would lie to myself and say, yes, this is happening for me because I have X number of years sober and I should have this happening to me. But I never really understood it because I was never painstaking about this phase of my development. This is the promises. It's at the end of step nine in the big book. It says, if I am painstaking about this place, about this phase of my development, I will be amazed before I'm halfway through. And this is an experience that I start to have. And, and I come to prime time and I start to build a character in one that can be wrong, that can admit complete defeat, that can uh, see that I can't do this. And I become amazed. And I do that through two. I start to develop this relationship. And three, I start to like really live this way. I become amazed. I'm going to know a new freedom and a new happiness. 
And the reason this is at step at the end of step nine is because it's through the process of accepting responsibility and vocalizing to the people whom I've harmed that I am responsible and that I'm accepting this responsibility and that I regret the things that I've done, that a weight is lifted off of me. I'm going to know a new freedom and a new happiness. I will not regret the past, nor will I wish to shut the door on it. I used to spend a lot of time in fantasy. I'd sit and I'd say, wouldn't it be nice if I could go back and go back in time like 10 years to when I was dating this one girl and she told me she wanted to get back together, but I was too dim to see it and I didn't get back together with her. And then she wanted to get, and then I wanted to get back together with her later and she didn't want to get back together with me. And then I would, I would extrapolate and build this entire fantasy about how my life would be and what stocks I would have bought because I would know everything I know now. And I would have this whole little picture built of how I would have, you know, been the next Bill Gates. And I'd spent hours doing this. Where the heck was I? I wasn't in peace and serenity. I was in regret about the past. And this says, I will not regret the past, nor will I wish to shut the door on it. And that's an amazing thing because now I can look at my past and see how I totally blew it with that girl. And I'm okay with it. My life is amazing today. I will comprehend the word serenity and I will know peace. I don't know if I can say anything more about that. No matter how far down the scale I've gone, I will see my experience can benefit others. That feeling of uselessness and self-pity will disappear. I was talking with um, uh, Rick and Fred last night. When I first came to prime time, I started to, to, to get this thing. and started to have a good experience. But I was struggling a lot with loneliness. And I went up and I asked a question. It was at Sylvie's meeting, and she answered the question. She said that loneliness is self-loathing. When I'm lonely, it's because I can't stand to be with myself. So what happens is, as I build a new character with these steps, I become the kind of person that I want to be around. And then when I'm with myself, I'm with a power, and I'm not lonely anymore. It blows my mind. I'm never lonely anymore. That feeling of uselessness and self-pity will disappear. I will lose interest in selfish things and gain insight in my fellows. Self-seeking will slip away. My whole attention and outlook on life will change. My whole outlook on life will change. I never thought to make honesty, tolerance, and true love of man and God a daily basis for living. It talks about that in step seven. I never thought to do that. Who makes honesty, tolerance, and true love of man and God a daily basis for living? Who would do that? But something, something tells me, why don't you give that a shot? And I give that a shot, and I see the world in a way that I never thought it possible to see. Fear of economic insecurity will leave me. I will intuitively know how to handle situations which used to baffle me. I will suddenly realize that God is doing for me what I could not do for myself. Are these extravagant promises? Yes. <laughs> I would ask you to look at the, the experience you've had this weekend and the people who've spoken and the people who you've had dinner with and the people who you've hung out in the bedroom with and the people you've gone on the hike with and the people who you have seen having an experience with this in their lives and then ask yourself again, are these extravagant promises? We think not. They're being fulfilled among us, sometimes quickly, sometimes slowly. And they will always materialize if we work for them, if we make these steps a part of our lives. Thank you. All right. Can we get Tommy off the floor? Any questions? I need to get off the floor. They need to get off the floor. Yes, huh? We're going to hang Michael here for a minute and see if anybody has anything to say. Sure. These extravagant promises. Oh, here comes. I see a yellow sheet of paper in the have a yellow sheet of paper. Yes. And the ballots are in. I actually wrote this before you kind of answered it, but.
Yeah. 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 Alan Turian. Okay, my sponsor told me to never say I'm sorry. What are your thoughts on this? Okay, um, and, and maybe I have this uh, answer, um, and maybe I don't, but I'll do my best. The reason step nine is in the ninth position is because I have to have a change of character. Because if I say that I'm sorry before I have a change of character, I'm going to do it again. And so I enter the, the two-step. I'm an alcoholic, and I'm sorry. <laughs> and then I go do alcoholic things, and I'm an alcoholic, and I'm sorry. And so um, I don't know if that's the answer that you're, that you're looking for, but I uh, when I say I'm sorry, I'm sorry is a question. I'm sorry is, will you forgive me? I'm sorry is, I need something from you. So if I say, if I make an amends with that in my heart, I'm not making an amends. I'm making that person the power for my life. And I'm not having the experience of letting God be the power for my life. Talk about the internal shift, how that occurred when you wanted to become a better man. Uh, I guess that's like a first step experience for me. But because, you know, Bob told us that these steps are a part of our lives and that I have to have the principles in this, of these steps in my life all the time, that means that even if I'm actively working on the ninth step, the first step still needs to be a principle in my life. And the principle in that, in that, in that first step for me is um, the principle of surrender. I see that I'm the kind of person that's caused all this wreckage. And I see that I'm the kind of person that can't manage my own life. And I experience demoralization and wallow in the mucky mire of my depression. And I become sick of it. And I reach that bottom. And I see that providence is my only opportunity to escape from this. And so I become willing. But that never goes away. Um, and, and this is a principle that's talked about in step one for me, which is, and I talk about this with everybody that I work with. Of course, I'm going to be the guy who does the wrong thing. It's my default setting. I need to know that I'm going to be the guy who's going to mess up. And then not excuse it, but accept that I'm that guy and strive forward again. And so when I carry that with me everywhere that I go, there, there's a shift that's occurred within me where I seek humility as opposed to trying to justify my actions. You know, I have a, 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 an 11-year-old stepdaughter who can't be wrong. Um, you know, she asks us, she has a rule that um, if we cuss, we have to pay money. And, and one day she was talking about something and she said a word that uh, she probably didn't know what it meant. I'm not going to repeat it here. But she did not realize it was an incredibly foul cuss word. And we looked at her like, what did you just say? And she didn't know what she said. And she got so upset, she started to cry because she didn't want to be the wrong person. She didn't want to be the person who had just broken her own rule. And that's such a painful place to be. And today, I can be free of that because I can be wrong. I'm going to be wrong. It's going to happen again. I guarantee it. And that's, that's where I want to be. I want to be small. I need to be small today.
How how do forgiveness and compassion play play in step nine? I want revenge. I want revenge against what has been done to me in my life. But what I really need is redemption. And I can't have redemption if I'm full of hate and full of judgment and empty of empathy. If I'm empty of empathy, I can only see my side and I can never forgive. But if I've started to do this process, I've seen that even me, the person who I thought was the greatest guy in the world, actually is not so great. I've started to see that I'm You know, maybe if I did something really wrong, even if this guy didn't do something as wrong to me as I did to that other guy, I can see how he did it. I can see how she did it. I know that there's something going on in there. And if if I'm accepted the fact that I'm this kind of person who can do this, then who am I to say that no one else can be that person? And when I seek a relationship with God, this is shown to me. I get this as deliverance or grace, an undeserved gift. And so uh, my ex-wife left me uh, for another man. Actually, I left. She kicked me out. Um, And uh, I desperately not wanted I desperately wanted for that to not happen. And about three months out, I had started coming to prime time and I was like, wow, I dodged a bullet. I got away. Because it was a very unhealthy relationship. But I had this sense that I needed to take care of her somehow, and so I said, No, I want a divorce. She was like, Well, what's gonna happen to me? And I said, Well, I'm gonna pay you alimony and um, I'm gonna give you an X amount of dollars a month for a year until you get back on your feet. And she said, okay, that's great. And then I still was attached to this relationship and I had this idea that I should be able to come by and do my laundry there from time to time and so forth and so on. (laughs) The Redskins were playing on television. I needed to go and watch the game. It was the playoffs. And she was like, no, you can't come over. You can't come over. And I couldn't figure out why it was. And she was dating some guy not the guy she left me for, just some guy. And some years later, I asked her, how come you were so upset about that? Why wouldn't you ever tell me anything about this guy you were dating? And she said, well, I have to tell you that the guy that I had an affair with moved in with me three months after you left. And I was paying her rent. I was paying his rent. And I was paying her alimony. And I was angry. I was very, very angry. I thought that I had had this spiritual experience with the divorce where I had let it go. And I was this spiritual guy, and I was consumed with hatred and resentment and could not get away. And it was causing me all kinds of problems in my life. And uh, I was told about the is it the keys to the kingdom the the prayer where you uh, you pray for that 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 uh, that those in your life who you resent have everything for their lives that I want for my life and so I started this prayer with resentment in my heart I I I I, I pray for you to have peace of mind and a strong connection with the power and a sense of being happily and usefully whole. And I I made that prayer every day with my teeth grit. And then one day I was making this prayer, maybe a month later, and I had a vision of her smiling. Just her smile. 
and I realized that it's not my job to hate her for doing what she did to me. It's my job to love her because everyone's worthy of love. And when I can love someone, then I'm filled with love, irregardless of what she did. And I have the love in my life because I'm filled with love. Now, I made the decision to not talk to her anymore. She's a toxic person, and she's no longer in my life, and it was the right choice. You know, I have an amazing relationship with my wife, and I move on, and I don't think about her anymore, but I don't hate her anymore. I don't have this gnawing sense of how dare she have done that to me. And that's not forgiveness from compliance. Forgiveness because it's what I'm supposed to do. It's forgiveness because it frees me. I get the freedom. How do you, or do you make an amends to a woman who is now in a relationship or married? I think we should have just combined it, that one. Well, it actually talks about it in the big book, and I, I didn't read about it. Um, it talks about uh, a, a need to make amends uh, for my sexual misconduct because I've caused jealousy and all kinds of stuff like that. Um, and when I started doing my my, uh, my ninth step with Jeff, um, I had this whole list of sexual misconduct. And, um, you know, I went to him and I was like, you know, there's all these women that I, I probably should make amends to. And we talked about it. And what we discovered is that uh, when I actually broken up with these women or they'd broken up with me, um, we'd had a conversation. And in the conversation, because I was starting to have a new way of life, and this may not be the case, because um, there certainly were certain situations where I had broken up with women and I wasn't living a new way of life, but where I made that amends at that moment... But then there's a situation where I have someone who uh, I've hurt and is with somebody else, and I may not be able to contact them without endangering them, without harming them. And this is something I got to go to my sponsor about, and I got to talk to them about because even if I contact them, I may arise, arise uh, I may create jealousy and suspicion. What if I send them an email surreptitiously, just trying to let them know that I want to chat, and their lover finds it? It's not their responsibility to be available to me to make that amends. If I'm going to harm them by making an amends to them, or harm their lover by making an amends to them, I'm not to do it. I have to make an amends in some other way. Okay, last one that I know of. Do I just say I'm sorry, or do I have to do my best to make the situation better? If I've done some harm where there is restitution to be made, then yes, absolutely. I need to do what I can do to make that better. Sometimes there's nothing that I can do to make it better. Um, I, I didn't talk anything about like the amends to a, to um, someone who's been deceased or someone who I can't find. I tried to make an amends to my old landlady. This woman took me in um, when I was a kid um, in school, going to college, and she treated me like a son. And she fed me, and when I uh, went absolutely crazy and wound up, you know, suicidally depressed, she nursed me back to health. And she treated me better than my own mother did. This is in sobriety. This is an un un untreated alcoholism. And when I moved out, I dismissed her from my life. And I had done some work for her, which I had been paid to do, some computer work. And she called me, and she said, I'm getting ready to retire, and this program that you wrote has some problems, and I don't want to pass it on to um, my next you know, the person who's taking over my job, and can you help me with it? No, no, I can't help you with that. And that was it. Never talked to her again. Now, I wronged her. I harmed her. I caused problems for her company by writing software that was not good. So I needed to make restitution for this. But I couldn't find her. I remember where I used to live, and I went back to that neighborhood 
to find her because I, I didn't have her phone number anymore. I didn't have anything. And I drove around the neighborhood for an hour knocking on people's doors saying, "Is it, because it all it's in Orange County and every house looks exactly the same and I couldn't remember what house it was. <laughs> and I prayed and I said, show me the house. And I, I knocked on these doors, you know, and nobody answered the door and knew who, they, knew who she was. And, you know, she may have passed away. They may have moved away. I have no idea how to find them. You know, I did internet searches for them. So in that case, I owe restitution to someone and was unable to make that restitution. I don't know what I'm going to do about that, but I do know that I'm going to try and live my life in such a way that I make restitution in my life by being a better person. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.